I'm just wondering what, what have you seen in relation on both sides as, as these, as the years pass, do people just kind of move on or how does it, what, what happens? Well, it can really vary. And I mean, there are some times where the previous family doesn't believe it, but often they do. And they're, especially when the child is really young, that they will want to have a relationship with the child's family. And sometimes they do. So they'll be, they'll, I'm thinking more in age here, but they'll have various trips back and forth. Sometimes even after the child has moved on, it doesn't particularly care to see the previous family anymore, but they're still wanting that connection because they build a connection to their loved one who died. I think like in, in Ryan's case where the, for the TV series as a 16 year old, or I guess he was 15 when they found it, but as a 15 year old meeting with Marty Warren's daughter and like say his niece, I mean, it's, it's too late. So, you know, it can be, I think, kind of frustrating for the previous family in that case that they really want to feel this connection and I mean, connection to their lost loved one, uh, but the kid's not in that place anymore. So, you know, it can be unsatisfying to them. But another example, of- yeah, another example of that connection and going back and forth is from the book. You talked about Kendra and Ginger. Can you re- to recount that story? Because I thought that was really, really interesting. Yeah, th- I mean that was one where it- it's unusual in our in our cases that uh, the girl, well, when she met this coach, she felt an immediate uh, attachment to it and w- was much more friendly and loving with her than. than she was too quite with strangers, um, and started to say that she had been uh, in Ginger's tummy and had, had gone through an abortion. And eventually it turned out that the coach did confirm to her mom that in fact, she had had an abortion, but the attachment became incredibly intense, both for the coach and for the child where the child has then spent a couple of nights a week at that coach's house. And I understand certainly that the wish to maintain that connection is not necessarily what the child needs in their development in this life. And, and eventually the, the, the girl's family had a falling out with, with the coach and severed contact, which I think is probably best for the child. So of course I say to, to parents in general, I mean, certainly be open to what the child is saying, be respectful. Uh, but you don't want to get overly focused on the past life because you don't want, don't want to interfere the experience of this life. And sometimes, you know, people can't, I mean, it is really interesting and, and, um, and meaningful, but sometimes I think people get a little too focused on it and, and need to let the child just be a child and, and enjoy their life. Is there anything, if you're a parent listening to this and you suspect that your child may be displaying some sort of past life memory, is there anything that they should do or shouldn't do to create a safe space for that? Or is there, any, is there like, are like a few questions that they should ask to verify whether or not this is actually what this is? Yeah, and we've got a short column of advice for parents on our website, but yeah, as far as what they should do, one thing we encourage people to write down the child statements, so that's setting a written record for us in, in case it can be verified. Uh, but most of the children recall uh, a death by some sort of unnatural means, murder, suicide, combat, accident, that sort of thing. And those memories can be troubling for the child. So if the parent can be respectful of that and say, I understand that you remember that, but now you're safe here with us and, and really try to emphasize that, that the past is the past and that things are different this time around. That can be helpful. I mean, and particularly in the Asian cases, often the children have gone to the previous place, seen the previous family. And then the intense, you might think the intensity of the memories would grow, but they, it actually tends to lessen they, partly because their memories are validated. They, they don't have to keep struggling to 
convince people because there it is, they see it themselves, but they also see that life is going on, moved on and families are grown older and have their own lives. So in the same way with, with parents in general, just emphasizing that those memories are behind them and, and this time they're all going to be, families going to be sick together and you know, have life this time. Uh, we don't encourage people to ask a lot of pointed questions. I mean, it's awfully tempting to try to find out what the name is, but the, the concern about asking a lot of pointed questions, one, it may upset the child, but two, they may start just making up answers and it's, it's better for the most part, it can kind of come spontaneously. I mean, when the child or uh, child is in that zone of wanting to talk about these things, certainly asking open-ended questions. Or what else do you remember? Or that must have been hard, or, or whatever. Letting the child talk, and again, yes, yeah, asking they remember what their name is, or where they lived, or whatever. I mean, that's very helpful for us. And yeah, if it's accurate. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day, so make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really gonna love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.